this might be the first, and I suspect the last time, that a red carpet will be laid out for me. <laughs> and let me also say that I am very happy that I will not have to answer questions from the brilliant Emma. <laughs> now, uh, Professor Liu has talked about the galaxy. I want to talk to you about the world, because we are seeing in slow motion a historic change in the nature of our world. So if you had to pick a label to put on the planet, you thought about it as if it were a product, what would your label be? You can see that mine is made in the West. That seems odd. Why? Some examples. Christianity is now a worldwide religion. But it never used to be. It has been that way for centuries. And that's the result of European empires that sprawled across the planet, annexed a fair amount of real estate, right? With missionaries following their wake, building churches and schools and doing not a little conversion um, of, of non-Christians. Take language. Spanish, French, but especially English, are now the medium for global commerce, diplomacy, and scientific research. Or think of light bulb, the internal combustion engine, railways, penicillin, the internet, you get the picture, right? But also think of institutions that were designed by the West and, in a sense, express the dominant position of the West. The IMF, the World Bank, NATO, and the European Union. Now, you're probably sitting here thinking, well, how far is the West really, has it really designed the world? Now, obviously, not everything of Western design has been positive. Let's take climate change, global warming. It was the child of the Industrial Revolution, born in Europe, raised in the United States, and then let loose on the rest of the planet. Or take those terrible weapons that killed between 60 and 70 million people in World Wars I and II alone, all of Western design and manufacture. Right? Ditto nuclear weapons. So when I say made in the West, I mean in the sense good and bad. Now, this is my theme for today. This made in the West world is being remade. It's being remade because of historic changes that have been unfolding for quite some time and will continue to unfold. We're still at the early stages of this process. In Asia, 60% of the world's population lives in Asia. And already, Asia has a larger economic output than the European Union and North America combined. So what happens in Asia makes a very, very big difference. The first sign of Asia's resurgence occurred in the middle of the last century, and it was provided by Japan. Now think about Japan in 1945. It was defeated. It was occupied. Indeed, it was a smoldering ruin. Just three decades later, it had become an economic powerhouse with levels of prosperity equivalent to that of the West, and it was until recently the second largest economy in the world, whose third, I'll get to that in a second. Right? Now, I remember back in the 70s and 80s, some of you are probably too young to remember, there was panic in Europe about how Japanese exports would kill Western jobs. How many of you here remember? Please let there be one person. All right, good. <laughs> thank, you, thank you very much. And a Harvard professor tried to stir the stew of suspicion, right, by writing a book called Japan as Number One. Yeah, his timing was a little off because in the 1990s, Japan fell into a deflationary trap from which it has only recently emerged. But the larger point stands. The larger point stands. Japan had by then arrived. Next up, in an even more remarkable story, South Korea. Think about this. In 1953, when the Korean War ended, South Korea had a, an income per person roughly equivalent to the African country of Ghana. It now has an income per person of 33,000. That is, as it happens, rank number 33 out of roughly 200 countries and economies. Right? And it's total economic output, GDP, 
often used as a measure of national power, as you know, is over $1 trillion rank number 14. Now, these kind of statistics can be mind-numbing, right? So think of things that you probably know. The LG cell phone, the Hyundai automobile, flat panel screens made by Samsung. And wasn't there this jumbotron that Samsung made that used to hang out in Times Square? I remember seeing it. Okay. We now know these as South Korean products. But only in the last 25 years has South Korea broken into these high-end realms of production. But the really big changes that are happening in Asia are not being driven by what's happening in Japan, nor by what's happening in South Korea. They are being driven by Asia's two giants. And of course, you know who I have in mind, China and India. Together, they constitute just a tad over 30% of the population of the world. And if you thought what's happening in South Korea and China, uh, South Korea and Japan, pardon me, was a big deal, what is happening and will be happening in China and India is much more significant. Let's start with China. Since 1978, two years after Mao died and some economic reforms were put in place, as you may know, since 1978, China has racked up an average, an average yearly economic growth rate of 9%. Now, there may be another country in history that's managed to do this. If it is, it's news to me. Now, what's been the result of this? China's GDP in 1979 was about $169 billion, give or take. It is now $8 trillion. It has increased 48-fold. Let's talk trade for a minute. As recently as 2006, the United States was the top trade partner for 127 countries. We were at the top 2006. Merely 12 years later, these numbers, as you can see, have flipped. China has, in a sense, arrived. Let's talk about other measures of Chinese power. Cold cash. China has a lot of it. It turns out that its cash reserves are equivalent to four trillion dollars, by far the world's largest. But there's another thing that you want to know about, and that is that China is also the United States' biggest creditor. It holds about 8% of our total national debt, thereby enabling Uncle Sam to pay his debts. And here's the thing, 1.3 trillion, by the way, is the dollar figure. Here's the kind of interesting thing. Our greatest competitor for the future is also our largest external creditor. Other signs of China being on the march? It's military power. Now, Chinese defense spending is about a third of that of the United States, and in frontline weaponry, such as aircraft carriers, stealth aircraft, and so on, China's behind. But the gap is closing. China already spends the second largest amount of any country in the world on defense. And guess what? Number three is Russia. China spends twice as much as Russia does. Now, you might ask, what does all this mean, this rise of China economically, politically, and militarily? Let me answer that question in two ways. First, it now requires the United States to take much bigger risks than ever before to defend our allies in the Asia-Pacific, Australia, South Korea, Japan, and so on. And you know what? They know it, we know it, and the Chinese know it. If you listen to the vocabulary of the most recent Chinese president, it's clear that they regard themselves as preeminent in Asia. There's another thing. You look at a map at the, of the South China Sea. Important world waterways go through the South China Sea. It has lots of hydrocarbon, gas, and oil deposits. There are many islands that various countries uh, claim. China says, you know what? <laughs> it's all ours. <laughs> and they enclose it on their maps with something called the Nine Dash Line. Those countries who have rival claims have been told to please sit on the school bench and mine their P's and Q's. Further north, in the East China Sea, not visible on this map, the Chinese have unilaterally recently proposed 
an air defense exclusion zone, which means that if you're a pilot from a non-Chinese country and you want to enter that space, you have to seek the permission of the Chinese authorities first. Now, you'll tell me, well, well, not all countries are doing it, but it is a sign, in a sense, of Chinese self-confidence. Now, let's turn to the other Asian giant, India. It's a slower-moving giant. It doesn't move fast. Indeed, for about 25 years since its independence in 1947, India was stuck at an annual economic growth rate of about 2.5%. The Indian economist Raj Krishna said tongue-in-cheek that India has what's known as the Hindu rate of growth. Some people found it funny, some people didn't find it, find it funny, but he was on to something. India seemed to be stuck. India is also a poor country. 25% of India's population still lives below the poverty line as designated by the World Bank. That is a dollar twenty-five per person per day. And when India does lead in certain world indicators, it's the kind of indicators that you don't really want to lead in. Stunted children, for example. So India's got a long way to go. But there's another side to the Indian story. Since 1990, when the government carried out some economic reforms, not this one, but its predecessor, India has averaged an economic growth rate of about 7%. Now, there's been a slowdown lately, as there has been in China, but here's the deal. European leaders and American leaders would kill for a sustained growth rate half that of what India and China have managed to achieve. Defense spending and military power, India's behind China to say nothing about the United States, but that's changing. It is now the world's ninth largest spender of defense budget, budgetary outlays in the world. And its military is becoming more muscular and more visible. Now, I've been talking about these trends but in a sense, they are future trends, right? I'm talking about what's going to happen in the future. But if you think about it and look at this graph, it really is a return to a very familiar historical pattern. Because before the 15th century, before the 15th century, most of world output was produced in Asia with China being among, China and India together, being among the world's leaders. So you could say, in a sense, the more things change, the more they remain the same. So one observation to conclude is that what we're seeing is a past pattern recurring again. I'll have more to say about that in a second. Now, China's rise and India's rise and the rise of the rest of Asia is not all necessarily a good thing. Remember we talked about our friend climate change, global warming? Now, imagine a world in which you had 2.5 billion to 3 billion Indians and Chinese who had our consumption patterns and the American love of the automobile. Just think about it, folks, and that is what they want to have. Not so much the automobiles, but they want to have our lifestyle, and why shouldn't they uh, do it, right? The other thing is that a rising Asia, I believe, may be a more fractious and conflict-laden Asia. Power changes are always disturbing to people and countries. Some examples. India and China, the two giants, are very different countries on almost every dimension. I don't have the time to go into why that is, but they have different agendas, different ambitions. They have had a long-standing territorial dispute. Their borders are garrisoned by many troops, and they fought a war before. There's an old saying, maybe even a Chinese saying, maybe it's an Indian saying, who knows? When the elephants fight, you know how the rest of it goes? The grass gets stomped. But as you can see from this map, India is not the only country worried about the rise of China. So is Vietnam, Indonesia, Japan, and other countries besides. In fact, these countries are already forming a coalition, along with India, 
where they exchange intelligence or information, engage in naval exercises, and so on. Now, is there one country that has to really worry about this? Yes, there is. The answer is yes. And that's Japan. Why? Not only because of the tense relationship between Japan and China now, which goes back to the whole question of Japanese imperialism in the 1930s and 1940s, disputes about who did what to whom, and so on, right? But also because Japan has had a great luxury. It has been able to spend less than 1% per year of its GDP on defense. You know why? Remember we talked about Uncle Sam? He's back. There's an American security guarantee. But here's the deal. When the gap between the United States and China narrows, Japan will have to recalculate the strategic plan that it has followed for almost the last generation. Now, people will tell you, oh, this is not true. There's the Japanese pacifist constitution. Japanese love origami. They're nice people. They would never. <laughs> develop their military, but that's ridiculous because the choice before Japan is not minimalism or militarism. There's something in between, and that is already happening. We can see that change happening now. But here's the problem. I'm always telling you about problems, right? Here's the problem. <laughs> Given the history of Japan, if Japan begins to scale up its military, alarm bells will go off throughout the Asia-Pacific especially in China, and especially in South Korea, but not just there, not just there. So what we see in Asia are two contradictory trends, investment and trade and communication, largely China-driven increasingly, right, are bringing the countries of the region together. But political rivalry and military rivalry are pulling them apart. Asia's future depends on which trend wins out. Let me leave you with a final thought. The resurgence of Asia and the relative decline, relative decline of the West, which will play out, I think, over many, many decades. I certainly won't be around to see it. Some of you may not be around to see it. That trend, paradoxically, actually reflects a Western success. Now, you might say, that's kind of strange, Western decline, Western success. Well, here's what I mean. We will not be able to tell or write about the story of Asia's resurgence without taking into account the millions of Asian students educated in American universities. Last year alone, the Chinese sent a quarter of a million students to American universities. I'm not even talking about Western universities. And if you add in the South Koreans and the Indians, those three countries account for 50% of all international students in American universities. We will not be able to tell the story of the resurgence of the West without taking into account how the West has disseminated knowledge, capital, and technology. So here's the bottom line. Throughout history, there is a pattern. Dominant centers of power, by virtue of their success, inevitably, although inadvertently, create competition by dispersing their knowledge. Every country that's been at the top of the heap, Rome, Britain, and now the United States, says, well, there's something unique about us. We are the exception. I'm here to tell you that that's probably not true. Remember the movie Mean Girls? <laughs> you thought I wasn't with it, right? But I am. Well, the Mean Girl who sits at the top of the heap, Crea um, the, the queen bee, is she called, right? The queen bee creates wannabes. <laughs> but how do the wannabes succeed? They learn what made the queen bee successful. And over time, the queen bee is displaced. But guess what? Every coming queen bee succumbs to the same logic. Don't trust me. Ask Lindsay Lohan.